Good afternoon readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf and today I'm finally getting around to doing a Jane Austen July related video that I have been planning since the beginning of the month. It's now the 31st of July so you can see how um, efficient I have been <laughs> this month. Um, I love Jane Austen July, it's it's one of my highlights of the reading year and I always try and do um, a Jane related video. This year the, the plan is um, to talk about pregnancy and early motherhood in the works of Jane Austen. Um, so last year I did a video with Roz from Scally Dandling about the books where we talked about Jane Austen's manipulative mothers and we were mostly focusing at that time of mothers of um, older children or, um, well, the, the I think the youngest was maybe the, their kids were a bit, be about four or five, um, but going up to how they manipulate when their children are sort of in, the, in their teens and twenties and the, the phase where they need to be sort of getting married and partnered off. Um, this uh, flips towards the, the complete other end um, and today I have been digging for evidence of pregnant women in Jane Austen's works and um, women with brand new babies. Now you might be thinking, are there any pregnant women in Jane Austen's books? Well, there are, but they aren't necessarily particularly obvious. You have to do a little bit of um, a little bit of digging, a little bit of investigation um, to realise who they are and where they are. And I even think that I may well have missed some of them. Um, so I'll be talking about them today. I'll also be drawing a little bit from Jane Austen's letters. Um, her letters are much much more full um, of pregnancy and childbirth to the point that I, at a certain point I had to just stop um, looking for more references in her letters because there was too much um, and it was going to become quite overwhelming but I've just picked out a few bits that will help to kind of contextualise or illustrate um, the things that we see in her novels. Um, so as we know Jane Austen never married, she was never a mother herself, uh, but she was an aunt from the age of 17 um, and we can assume that she probably expected to be a mother um, for a decent proportion of her um, like young adult, early adult life, um, probably at least until she was she remained unmarried um, sort of after, after 30, she would have expected to potentially get married and potentially become a mother. Um, she was surrounded by um, the maternity of her, her friends and relatives and um, definitely it seems from her letters that their uh, their experiences with childbirth uh, provided her with a lot of gossip and a lot of um, letter writing fodder and a, a lot of uh, entertainment and, and diversion and we have a lot of comments of, from her about sort of various babies that she knew um, that sound sort of affectionate and positive and um, it's interesting that I've, I've seen when reading for this I saw a few people kind of saying that they felt that Jane Austen um, never got married not because she wanted to write but because she was afraid of being a mother or didn't want to be a mother uh, or had negative views about motherhood um, based on some of her the way that she phrases some of her comments in her letters which is sometimes um, possibly slightly uh, satirical but you know that's what we know about Jane Austen she's she's always satirical she can't really um stay serious about anything at all so I don't really think that that point of view is valid um and I think that we also see a kind of like a a, a loving and positive side to her from her letters where she's talking about her her young nieces and nephews um so that's my view on 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 that topic um so what I wanted to start with, um, because it, it's where the mothers are hiding, um, is the idea of a delicacy, a euphemisms and terminology related to uh, childbirth in, in the world of Jane Austen, because it's not always super obvious um, uh, who, who is pregnant or isn't pregnant. Um, and in the letters it can be a bit more obvious. A couple of times in the letters she uses um, sort of more direct, um, old-fashioned, indelicate terminology, such as saying that a woman has been breeding. Um, so breeding means that she's pregnant. Um, but in her books she tries to toe the line and she tries to um, maintain a veneer of, of, of dignity around it. And there was certainly, um, it, it seems that at that period, so the turn of the turn of the century, that Regency phase, um, was a period in which attitudes to what women could reveal about pregnancy were changing. So we, we get kind of this sense that um, we're moving towards the excessive politeness of the Victorian era and away from the kind of Georgian era idea of, of people breeding. Um, the best sense that we get from that um, is in Sense and Sensibility. So Charlotte Palmer is the pregnant woman that we probably see the most of in all of Jane Austen's work. So that is Mrs. Jennings's daughter or Lady Middleton's sister. Um, if you can't, if you don't know who that is, you're probably, probably 
this video is, is maybe a little bit more in depth than, than you need. Um, this video is aimed at people who've read all of the, the novels um, and don't mind the potential for a, a couple of potentially spoilerish, uh, but not really uh, references as we go along. Um, so Charlotte Palmer is described as being in a situation. Um, so situation is like the favourite word um, in the novels for describing somebody who is pregnant. Um, so she arrives at Barton Cottage, Cottage, comes to meet the Miss Dashwoods for the first time ever. Um, and Mrs Jennings says, for you know, nodding significantly and pointing to her daughter, it was wrong in her situation for her to have travelled so far so quickly. Um, and she goes on to say of her daughter that she expects to be confined in February. So confined was as in the, the expected date of delivery, as we would call it now, um, nice and broad, around about a month, um, as it should be really. Um, this is the most open discussion of pregnancy that we have anywhere in the books um, and we can tell that it is seen as being a little bit too open by the next sentence um, so we can it, it's it's suggested that it's indelicate because Lady Milton who is also in the room uh, Lady Milton could no longer endure such a conversation um, so it's seen as being like a little bit a little bit too open a little bit too honest um, What's interesting um, for me is that this conversation takes place when Charlotte is about six months pregnant. So it takes place in November. Uh, she's expecting to be confined in February. Um, so we know that she probably, she must have some degree of visible pregnancy. She must have a bump. Obviously um, the dresses at the time, particularly with the, the high-waisted and the, the kind of flowy uh, bottoms, the empire line look, um, were probably quite good for disguising pregnancies. Um, and in terms of how she's introduced, she's, she's described only as kind of like quite short and plump. Um, so it doesn't necessarily say that the pregnancy is obvious. Um, we're probably getting towards the point where she's not going to be able to really, really hide this for longer. So the fact that um, Lady Middleton is so keen for it not to be said out loud uh, kind of tells us something um, about that um definitely pregnant women did have visible pregnancies Jane Austen makes various references to uh, pregnant women looking pregnant in her letters uh, so it's for instance in letter 11 um, an eight month a woman who is eight months pregnant is described as being uncommonly large um and in future letters she talks about women being oh not very large for her normal of a woman who who's been pregnant frequently for instance um Situation is also used again when talking about uh, Mrs. Weston. She's another pregnant woman that we see quite a lot of, although her pregnancy is not very spoken of. Um, it's situation as a word. It's interesting. Jane Austen uses that word a lot. It's not just used about pregnancy. So she talks a lot about people's sort of situation in life um, when they talk. She's talking about what kind of income they might have. So it's it's a very catch-all euphemism um, for saying you know this is you know the the context that this person is is in and situation then becomes uh, sort of about pregnancy as well. So Mrs. Weston is said to be a hot topic for the Highbury gossips uh, due to her situation, whose happiness it was to be hoped might eventually be as much increased by the arrival of a, of a child as that of all her neighbours was by the approach of it. That's in chapter six. So this, um, is this conversation is taking place in June and the baby is born in July. Um, Mrs. Weston and uh, married Mr. Weston in, we think around September. So really July is probably the earliest possible uh, that she could be having that baby. So they're, they're obviously being quite efficient there. Um, so she's shown as being just a little bit anxious. She's not very, really that happy about uh, the, the baby yet. She's going to be happy in the future, they hope. Um, and she's right to be anxious. Uh, so we see from Jane Austen's letters um, that there is a very diff definite awareness of the risks of childbirth um, around them. Um, so in letter 11, she says, I never told you that Mrs. Coulthard and Anne, later of many down, are both dead and both died in childbed. Um, so we're talking two close acquaintances died in quick, quick succession, quick enough to be included in the same letter. Um, and Mrs. Weston must have been an older mother by the standards of the time. So she spent 16 years um, with Emma. Um, so if you think that she was probably 18 when she took on the role of governess, she's got to be over 30. She's like 32, 33 by the time that she's giving birth. Just a in the room here. Um, at that time, maternal mortality, we don't know exactly what it was, but I've seen some um, writing by Chamberlain in 2006, um, who's estimated it in various parishes to be about 7.5 per thousand live births. That doesn't sound like a lot, but for context, um, today that is now 13 per 100,000 live births. So that's, that's a huge difference. Um, and when you think about how many 
you know how many women you might know in your acquaintance who'd be having kids at that time um you know you you would come across quite a few of them um obviously there were various reasons for maternal mortality um some of which was the lack of understanding of how things like infection could spread and um, in 1790 a very forward thinking doctor called dr alexander gordon actually suggested that it might be doctors who were spreading infection between pregnant women um, and women just after giving birth which presumably is what happened to these two related women who who were both of many down who both died similar times um but he he was ridiculed and, and ignored um until uh, sort of about 50 years later a very famous austrian doctor was then credited for for coming up with this this brainwave that um yes could have been fixed 50 years earlier um so going back to, to more identifying more pregnant characters then, uh, by the use of this word situation, uh, we also have Eliza in Sense and Sensibility. So Eliza is the ward of Colonel Brandon. She is the young woman who is seduced by Mr. Willoughby um, and who is sort of found months later. Um, and Colonel Brandon says that, that she was left by Will Willoughby in a situation of utmost distress. Um, now, she obviously would have been in, in quite great distress to have been seduced and, and taken somewhere else um, by a lover and then deserted regardless. But that word situation, I think, is supposed to let us know um, what is confirmed later on, that she was left pregnant by him. Um, a fact that he denies later on knowing that, that she was pregnant, but um, in any case, he must have known that it was a risk. Um, and the final little reference that I just had to include is Mr. Collins. Um, Mr. Collins writing about his wife, uh, Mrs. Collins, so Charlotte Lucas, that was. Um, and it's it's typical Mr. Collins' grandiloquence because it, it starts with the same word. So the rest of the letter is only about his dear Charlotte's situation. There we have it again, situation. Um, and it's his expectation of a young olive branch. Um, so he's not just writing, oh, I hope to have an heir. He's writing that he's going to have a young olive branch. This is is particularly entertaining to me because we get a couple of letters from Mr Collins over the course of Pride and Prejudice um, and uh, th this one this takes place in chapter 57 I should say um, but the earlier the, the earlier letter the first letter that we get from him also talks about an olive branch and this is the offered olive branch um, that he, he his peace offering towards the Bennett family um, so uh, it's interesting that it seems to be this kind of favoured metaphor of his um, and obviously we've got to remember that at the time um, Olives were quite exotic and olive branches were very much this kind of religious metaphor that you'd see in the Bible, but you wouldn't really um, come across that frequently. Um, so the absurdity of the way that he announces Charlotte's pregnancy uh, sort of fits with the general absurdity of, um, of his character. But I like this because this is really, for Charlotte, it's her happy ending. Um, so she gets married to Mr. Collins just after Christmas. In March, uh, Elizabeth goes to visit her and she has only her home and her housekeeping, her parish and her poultry um, to distract her from her unbearable husband. Um, but this letter comes in October. So we know that by October, she's actually got uh, something a lot more positive to look forward to. And presumably by this point, she's quite far on in her pregnancy, um, just because we know that people probably wouldn't announce it too, too early on. Um, so, on the one hand, she's got to look forward to a lot of interference from Lady Catherine de Bourgh. But on the other hand, she actually has something um, that hopefully will absorb her attention and care a little bit more than her parish and her poultry. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a positive end for her, I think. Um, just while we're talking about Charlotte Lucas, I would have assumed that pregnant women wouldn't travel very much, that they would be kind of shielded. Um, talking about that kind of health anxiety that I already mentioned, um, I would have thought that they wouldn't be allowed to sort of participate in, in society or be very active. But actually, we see quite a lot of references in the books to maternal travel and, and mothers being quite happy to kind of go from place to place. So Charlotte Collins herself um, travels 50 miles um, at the end of the book uh, while pregnant um, in chapter 60, simply to avoid Lady Catherine de Bourgh. <laughs> Um, which is understandable, like who wouldn't want to avoid Lady Catherine de Bourgh? Because 
Lady Catherine is furious about Elizabeth and Darcy uh, being going to be married and Charlotte is quite happy about it. Um, so she travels 50 miles and that's a journey that Elizabeth has already described as being no easy distance uh, for their circumstances. Um, so I think it's fairly significant that she feels able to do that. Um, Charlotte Palmer, similarly, she tra travels from her home at, at Cleveland all the way to Barton Cottage via London. So they take quite a roundabout route to do it. She then travels back to London um, and even in the very late, so we, we know she's six months pregnant um, when she's at Barton Cottage, when she's in London, she's in the last weeks of her pregnancy really and she's still um, socially active, she's still dining out, um, she's still paying morning visits. Um, uh, this sort of in chapter 26 she's hosting a dinner um, so we know that, sorry there's a lot of emergency services driving past today so I hope there's nothing major going on but sorry for that, that disruption. Um, so we don't see that kind of um, confinement starting early at all. We, we just see that kind of, uh, uh, yeah, engagement in, in active social life. The same happens in Emma with Mrs. Weston. Um, I kind of didn't realise until I was looking at this that how close together the timeline is. Um, but the pregnant Mrs. Weston is, is like actively involved in a lot of the scenes of hybrid social life. Um, she is recorded as walking all the way to Donwell Abbey when she's eight months pregnant um, in chapter six. Um, she skips the carriage ride to Box Hill the next day, but uh, in chapter six, she walks all the way to Donwell Ab Abbey and it says that she, when she arrives, it seems like she walked on purpose to be tired and to sit with Mr. Woodhouse. I'd imagine at eight months pregnant, walking to Donwell Abbey on a very hot summer day, she would be quite tired and she probably would need to sit down in the cool with Mr. M Mr. Mr. Woodhouse um, and eat cold meat. Um, but yeah, I, d I did find it interesting how um, active these women typically were. Um, so next thing I wanted to move on to then is the actual process of confinement and delivery. Um, so the person that we hear the most about for this is Charlotte Palmer again. Uh, so it happens in chapter 36, we see the newspapers announce to the world that the lady of Thomas Palmer Esquire was safely delivered of a son. Um, the bit I love about this is that instantly we get, so we get Charlotte, she, she's had her confinement, what was typical of the time was they had a, a lying in, so they would be expected to sort of stay in, um, typically in one room, um, inside the house at least for like the first month, um, there's accounts of, of, of women being kind of uh, kept in one room with all the heat kept really high and all of the drafts excluded um, and the, the, the nurse would be involved and, and there was just general um, a real emphasis on this like recovery period uh, which is in fact kind of harmful to health but obviously that wasn't understood at the time. Um, what I love about this is then we see the, the emergence of the grandmother. So Mrs. Jennings immediately uh, goes into grandma mode um, and she is with her daughter every single day from dawn till dusk effectively. Um, and she is, is really engaged in those first few weeks of um, care of the child and really engaged in trying to, to help her daughter to recover. Um, and it's one of the things that shows us that even though Mrs. Jennings is um, and sometimes an irritating and sometimes a ridiculous character, she really has a, a solid good heart and she's a very uh, caring kind of person, uh, which we see again later on when she looks after Marianne during her illness. Um, she comes away at the end of every day uh, really thrilled and excited about her grand grandson and um, ready to give so exact, so minute a detail of her situation as only Miss Steele had curiosity enough to desire. And that's so realistic, isn't it? This, uh, this kind of super enthusiasm about the new baby uh, when actually there isn't probably a lot to say. Um, for two weeks she does that, she's with Charlotte every single day, dawn till dusk, um, and then she drops her visits to sort of two times daily. So we can see that kind of intensive phase of the early lying in um, and that kind of tailing off as, uh, as, as Charlotte recovers. Um, another great description of sort of late pregnancy preparation and lying in um, we get from Jane Austen's letter. So letter 11, again, there was a lot of child related stuff in letter 11. Um, Mary, so that's Jane Austen's sister-in-law, the one that was uncommonly large, um, is said to be, they've got to see her in the last couple of weeks of her pregnancy, she's said to be still more glad to get rid of her child of whom she is heartily tired. Um, so you get this great image of this very large, very pregnant Mary just desperate to, to give birth already. Um, I believe it's her first child as well, so she's like really kind of uh, ready to go. And at this point, it seems that her nurse has already arrived. So the nurse that's going to look after her and the baby um, immediately after delivery and that will 
probably stay with the baby for quite some time. Um, and they talk about the kind of the, the building the relationship like but they they don't seem to particularly get along at first but they're kind of hopeful that um, Mary and the nurse will, will start to get to know each other a bit better because this nurse comes very highly recommended. Um, by the next day, the day after this visit, um, they get a message to say Mary was brought to bed last night of a fine little boy and a message saying that, that everything's going well so far with both of them. A few days later they then go to visit Mary during her lying in and Jane Austen writes um, in letter 13, Mary does not manage matters in such a way as to make me want to lay in myself. Um, and generally just thinks that Mary looks a bit uncomfortable, unhappy, not, not looking like she's really enjoying the new mum experience. So I suppose she's probably getting what, what today we would call the baby blues. Um, or maybe she's just like having a, had a really bad night um, and having to entertain her, her, her sister-in-law and maybe not very keen. At that point, Jane was about 23. So at that point, she really probably was thinking that she was quite likely to one day end up having to lay in herself. And she would have met various of her other sort of relations, friends, sisters-in-law during the lying in period. It seems that it wasn't prohibited to visit a woman at that time um, if they were a close acquaintance, as you can see from, from this situation. Um, so other uh, lyings in that we see, um, <laughs> less less comfortable perhaps, um, Eliza, so the Colonel Brandon's ward again, as soon as she recovered from her lying in, I found her near her delivery, I removed her and her child into the country. Um, so in a way this kind of shows the uh, dictatorial nature of uh, Colonel Brandon's character, that he, re I removed her into the countryside, I, I don't, I, yeah, he's, he's very directive of, of what Eliza can do now that she's kind of become, uh, um, an, an unmarried mother um but yeah so she would have stayed sort of a month or so um in the place where she had her baby and then she she gets to go into the countryside so again able to travel relatively soon um and mrs price <laughs> no uh, w that's fanny price's mother in mansfield park at the start of mansfield park she's she's already got a superfluity of children and she's preparing for her ninth lying in so that's the ninth time that she's going to have a baby um we can see from the way that she then, in this period where she's preparing for her night flying in, she writes to her family members, she begs for their assistance. We can see that emotional load and that emotional burden and potentially all of those, those hormones and stresses overwhelming her a little bit. And she just thinks, I really need some help with this. Um, but for her, that her ninth lying in, I mean, she must be pretty much an old hand at this by now. So you'd imagine that although there would still be those same risks associated, she wouldn't be maybe as anxious or as scared of her her labour as um, maybe one of the, the first time mums would be. And every other mum that I found in these, um, in the books themselves is, is a first time mother. Um, and finally, Mrs. Weston's friends were all made happy by her safety. And if the satisfaction of her well-doing could be increased to Emma, it was by knowing her to be the mother of a little girl. That's in chapter 17 of Emma. Um, I like that the first thing they say about Mrs. Weston is not that she's been delivered or brought to bed, that she's had her lying in. It's just they were happy about her safety. And I think that emphasizes what I said before about her being an older mum and they, their awareness maybe being that there were higher risks around um, her being an older mum. Even though by today's standards, she, she wouldn't really be considered an older mum, depending on how old she was when she became a governess. She could have been, she could have been older than 18 easily. Um, but that recognition that, that she's come through to the other side and everything's gone all right. Um, so moving on then to the period immediately after birth, the, the focus shifts from the, the mum to the child um, and child health becomes a big source of preoccupation. We see a lot of sort of communal anxiety over the health of young children um, in the works. I initially didn't realise how much there was to say, so I was going to talk about sort of older children, sort of the six and seven year olds that we, that we meet at various stages. Um, but just, well, I'll keep it on the babies because the, there's just quite a lot more to say than I thought. Um, and that, that's completely justifiable. So infant mortality um, was around 350 to four, 400 per thousand live births in London. That's rates were higher in London than elsewhere, but they were the numbers I could find um, in the middle of their 18th century. And that declined over the next century to about 160 per thousand live births. Um, which is still really, really quite high. So um, some of the mums survived, but a lot of the babies uh, didn't. Um, and research actually suggests that maternal mortality, uh, infant mortality was worse 
in higher social classes. So the, the more socially advantaged you were, the less likely that mothers would take up um, practices like breastfeeding and, and like being closely involved with the early parenting of their child um, and possibly the more likely the baby would be to be exposed to um, some very some of the very weird medical practices of the time rather than just being allowed to sort of get over minor ailments um, but breastfeeding was seen to be one of the, the key differences in research by somebody called Dr Davenport from Cambridge and we'll try to put the links for uh, the various references that I've mentioned down in the description below um, so yeah we know that, that babies very well did die. And we have stark reminders of this from Jane Austen's own letters. Uh, so even in her, the very first letter that we have from her, she says, I'm sorry for the Beecher's loss of their little girl, especially as she is the one so much like me. Um, it's kind of funny, the, the light hearted, almost the flippant nature that, that Jane Austen, uh, the tone that she uses when she's talking about these um, dying babies um, and we have to assume that the beaches themselves really felt their loss very keenly we know that the, the grief was a thing that happened um, you know regardless of what people say about or you know they expected it grief was really a, a very serious thing and always, and always will be losing a child at that um, kind of phase um, but I suppose for Jane, there were people at a certain distance from her, and for her it was a degree of just gossip. And we see that again, um, even worse in letter 10. Um, Mrs Hall of Sherborne was brought to bed yesterday of a dead child some weeks before she expected, owing to a fright. I suppose she happened unawares to look at her husband, which is really quite cutting. Um, and I think it's, it's one of the things that people are sort of referring to when they talk about Jane Austen obviously not liking... Um, not liking the idea of, of motherhood and, and mothers um but I, I also think it's it's just her way like she's not serious about anything at all really in her letters her letters were, were written to entertain and if by entertaining she could soften the blow of the news that she's imparting by a bit of dark humor um it, I, it seems like that's a very natural thing for her to do um although it reads oddly to our sort of modern eyes um, this translates then into the novels, um, with Charlotte Palmer in particular, um, in chapter 37, she's quite in a fuss about the child um, because the child is not doing so well. Experience Mrs Jennings turns up and says, oh, it's nothing but the red gum. Um, I don't know what the red gum was supposed to be, but some kind of minor childhood ailment that happens in the first sort of month of life. Um, it's kind of an indication of the changing um, norms of the time that Charlotte is dissatisfied with this and she insists on sending for the doctor. Um, and that's what we kind of had at this, this period of the Regency period in the century beforehand, the involvement of medical men in childbirth um, and the postpartum period had been significantly increasing. Um, and the involvement of midwives and sort of female knowledge was starting to be on the, the decline. There was still, um, and that was much more so in the higher social classes. Um, so we can see that from Charlotte immediately being like, no, I need to see a doctor. Uh, Charlotte's anxiety about her, about her baby um, continues after the, they move, They all move to Cleveland. Marianne gets ill. They send for the apothecary. Um, and this is in chapter 43, the, apothe the apothecary, by pronouncing her disorder to have a putrid tendency and allowing the word infection to pass his lips, gave instant alarm to Mrs. Palmer on her baby's account. So her husband is not concerned and he tries to sort of dismiss it, um, but he, he can't resist her anxiety and he ends up having to uh, move her, her baby and her nurse uh, to the friends, to, to the house of a, of a friend nearby uh, to keep her sort of safe from this infection. Having seen what we've seen, I absolutely think that's completely justifiable on Charlotte Palmer's part, but it fits into a kind of a longer pattern of, of mothers of small children in Jane Austen's works, where they seem to be sometimes a little bit over worried and overreactive about their, their children's uh, sort of health, um, which I don't really have time to go into. The last little bit that I just wanted to mention was the, the idea of babies as a sort of a way of bringing people together and a source of communal interest. I've already said um, about how um, the pregnancies were a source of sort of gossip and letter writing, uh, but we see some lovely scenes, particularly in Emma, where um, Emma and Knightley are looking after little baby Emma, so her, her sister's daughter, um, and that is enables them to have a bit of a reconciliation. Um, that happens in chapter 12 after Harriet Smith has refused Robert Martin. And then later on at the end, they all gather around Mrs. Weston's baby. Um, and it means that there was no longer a want of subject or animation. This is in chapter 18. And that's when Frank Churchill is able to speak to Emma for the first time um, after the engagement is known and, and to say kind of like, I'm sorry. He doesn't really say he's sorry, but you know, he, he more or less accepts his guilt. <laughs>
So that was a little quick rundown of pregnancy and early motherhood in the works of Jane Austen. It's just going to be under 30 minutes. I've tried to speak so fast. Um, I hope you found this interesting. Did you notice any mothers that I've missed? Have you got anything else to say um, about this phase? I find it quite interesting. Obviously, it's, it's what's the future for our heroines. This is what's going to be happening to Catherine Morland and, and Emma and so on, you know, in, in the next couple of months and years of their life. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for watching and take care.